Labour are doing pretty well in the polls, but there are new concerns about the political direction of the Labour Party under Keir Starmer. This came this weekend uh, when the Times gave a pretty worrying report um, about attempts by the Labour Party, by its new leadership, to try and woo back rich, wealthy donors. Um, so we can get up part of this, this report from the Times. Um, so it says, Sir Keir Starmer has launched a charm offensive to attract Labour donors who ended their support under Jeremy Corbyn in an attempt to reduce its reliance on trade union funding. Right, now let's just stop there for a moment. Because, uh, Sir Keir Starmer has launched a charm offensive to attract Labour donors who ended their support under Jeremy Corbyn in an attempt to reduce its reliance on trade union funding. So it's, it's very explicit. They don't want to be reliant on the vehicles of organised labour. They want to be reliant on rich people. What, what policies do you think being reliant on organised labour encourages? What policies does being reliant on big business encourage? You can work it out. The Labour leader is believed to have begun sending personalised letters to lapsed donors asking them to consider renewing their support for the party. If the fundraising drive is successful, it could return Labour to the Blair era in which it competed with the Conservatives in raising millions from the rich and famous. Some of New Labour's biggest supporters included J.K. Rowling. But this is the, this is the big one. Um, this, this final paragraph. So among those who have received letters from Sakir is David Abrahams, the Newcastle property tycoon um, who donated more than 650,000 to the party under Tony Blair. So Mr. Abraham said that Sakir had got off to a good start, but there's still a lot of resistance to what he's doing. And he said that he wanted to see the expulsion of members who made anti-Semitic comments. This is someone who's, who wants to see more expulsions. Obviously, it depends what he interprets as an anti-Semitic comment. Um, but this issue I want to focus on is the £650,000 this man donated to the Blair years. We've already heard, you know, this, this Times write-up, which is from a briefing, is saying this could return the party to the Blair years. Um, now, I've got a clip for you, which is I'm really pleased to be able to show you. I was delighted when I found out the, you know, the relevant clip today when I was looking through these um, for a background on this guy. So um, he was a, a massive donor, as it says, to New Labour, £650,000 to the party under Tony Blair. This was very controversial at the time um, because he was a property developer. Labour were in government. And just as you've seen with Robert Jenrick, you had a big donor to a political party having decisions made in their favour. Now, for background to this, we're going to go to our old friend, um, Paul Mason, hosting a news report 12 years ago. This is property, and that means he's routinely involved with seeking planning permission for projects here in the North East. At the highest level, planning is a political process, both in Whitehall and in the Labour-controlled councils of the North East. As you can see, there are quite a lot of them. It's politicians that get to decide on Mr. Abraham's projects. So knowing whether he's giving them money is, above all, relevant to that. In July 2005, Abraham's company, Durham Green Developments, submitted plans for a business park next to Junction 61 on the A1. Two directors of the company, Ray Ruddick and Janet Kidd, had already given £77,000 of Mr. Abraham's money to Labour. By October, the Highways Agency had blocked the project, but one year later, and £182,000 more donated to Labour, the agency lifted its objections. Another area of the North East Mr Abrahams took an interest in was Sedgefield, the then constituency of Prime Minister Tony Blair. In 2005, and again this year, a Mr D Martin of Acorn Residential Estates is listed as a consultee for Sedgefield's local development framework. Actually, Mr Abrahams and D Martin are the same person. So what representations did Mr. D. Martin make to the Borough Council? Actually, none, says the Council. However, with the constituency Labour Party, it was different. He was, said one local Labour politician, a hanger-on. Another said he often sent a note to Tony congratulating him. He was invited to Blair's farewell speech, says one source, as someone you could rely on not to stand up and heckle. Despite not living there, nor having any business with the council, he came along to various things of Tony's as a member. That was when Paul Mason was still an anti-capitalist mole at the heart of the British establishment. Um, it's very real blast from the past there. Um, anyway, let's focus on the issue at hand. Um, so we should say Abrams was cleared by the police of any wrongdoing because um, he was ended up being under, under investigation for donations he made to the Labour Party, which were related to the fact that he was, he was donating to the Labour Party by proxy. Um, so obviously we have laws in this country whereby if you donate more than £5,000 to a political party, it has to be completely public so that people can assess and analyse conflicts of interest. In this case, there were clearly lots of conflicts of interest because he was trying to develop properties where 
you know, the government and local councillors had had control over whether or not it, it, it got approved um, or not. But he was donating to the party via proxy, so via mainly his employees. And this was so controversial that Labour's general secretary at the time had to resign, right? Because this was such a scandal. This took up the time of like Gordon Brown. It was, a, you know, took up the news cycle. This was literally, we were in government. He was prime minister at the time. Um, and, you know, it just seems surprising to me that this is what we want to go back to. Um, Abraham's also an interesting character. According to Channel 4 News report from the time, he won selection to be a prospective Labour Party candidate, but was then deselected after it emerged that the people who he introduced as his wife and child at the selection meeting were just pretending to be his wife no. and child. Um, so in return for him paying for their accommodation and the boys' school fees. So, so this is someone who was, this is the kind of people, you know, who, as, as Paul Mason says in that report, this was someone who was you know, very close to Tony Blair, often had a front, front row seat at Tony Blair speeches. And this is who, you know, New Labour were in bed with, property developers, people who wanted decisions from, from the government to be made in their favour. And yes, I mean, it seems like there's no, there was no smoking gun as to, ah, yeah, he gave the money, so he gave him the, you know, the, the, go, the go ahead for this particular building which means that the police have said no, 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 no law has been broken. But you can see how going back to this period of time where Labour can very easily and plausibly be accused of corruption because they've got you know, these very wealthy people giving them money, which they've become reliant on. Labour at that time had very few members um, who can then use that leverage to get decisions made in their favour. I mean, this is really not the direction we want the party to go in. Actually, before I go to you, I've got one more fact about this guy. He's a very interesting character. Uh, so uh, he got deselected after that selection where he introduced um, his fake wife and fake child. It then turned out that he'd said he was 41 and he was actually 46. Um, but let's talk about, instead of sort of strange pathological lies, let's talk, actually, he's probably got loads of money to sue us. So he lied twice, maybe it's not pathological. Um, Labour, desperate to become the party of landlords instead of the party of trade unions. What do you make of it? Yeah, it's really strange. Because the one thing that, that's inarguable about the Corbyn period was they, the party had money. The party had money. You can just go through their sort of annual, you know, the, the, the end of year kind of projections and forecasts and the financial year behind, etc. They, they were regularly raising more money than the Conservative Party. In the run-up to the election last year, they were struggling because it was, you know, it was a very short turnaround. Uh, but in the period of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, 2015, 2020, they raised a lot of money. And you have to remember in 2008, Labour was almost bankrupt, right? And, and that is, and that, that was the period of time you just brought up with that clip. That seems to be the plan in terms of what they want to go back to regarding resources. And I, I know lots of people say, actually having lots of members is bad, fewer members is good, but members pay subs, right? That, that's, that's indisputable. Again, you know, having lots of members means you have lots of money uh, and I don't know. I, I think the kind of the, the, the management of Labour on this side, I think it's gonna, it could get very messy. If they lose lots of members, and they have, we don't know how many because you get, there's a six months kind of stay with regards to direct debits being cancelled. So we don't know yet. But if they lose, you know, a couple of hundred thousand members, unions start sort of playing silly buggers, they, they, will, they will again have to go with a begging bowl to property developers and millionaires. And that's not good. It's not, it's not the people who, oh, the brand. What was it, a good brand to have Peter Mandelson have to resign because of this kind of stuff? The Hinduja brothers, the Eccleston affair, was that good for the brand? No, it wasn't. You know, uh, for whatever good things Labour did in government with regards to policy, I don't think many people say, yeah, their dealings with millionaires and billionaires looked really good, reflected really well on the project. Nobody thinks that. So why, when people say it's a return to New Labour, I said, that's not quite true. Come on, Starmer's his own person. But, this looks like a return to New Labour. It's like the worst thing you would want to do. When you say return to New Labour, what do you mean? You mean, you mean winning general elections? You mean you know, initiating a mixed bag of policies? You mean often quite brave constitutional reforms like devolution? And we all want a professional campaigning organisation, yeah. right? No, no, no one's disagreeing with that. We all want well-written speeches. But <laughs> what we don't want is a party that's in hoc to landlords because one, I mean, it looks really bad. And two, it's incredibly bad for democracy. I want to bring up... Uh, one one more bit of evidence um, with relation to this particular story, because not only is courting big donors a threat to our democracy and completely undermining of the, the radical potential or the potential radical potential of the Labour Party, not which is obviously very much um, waning since Starmer became leader. But anyway, it's also very tacky. 
Um, so these these campaigns to try and get the wealthy to donate money to the Labour Party, oof, tacky as hell. Let's get up this graphic. It's a, a page from a brochure which was sent out to um, wealthy donors. This was shared by Gabriel Pogrand from The Times. Um, and it invites you to join the chair circle membership. I don't know why they call it like, it sounds real Freemason stuff, doesn't it? You can join the chair circle jerk society Pathetic. where you all sort of suck up to kids. Caviar, call it what it is, caviar with kid. <laughs> That's, that's what it should be called. Let's get it back up because we can see what you get by by becoming part of the chair circle. Why do they call it the chair circle? Um, you can get regular communications from the party's fundraising team. Very exciting. Invitation to a brunch ahead of Labour leaders' speech at annual party conference. Not clear if Starmer's is going to be there or not. Um, <laughs> invite only. You know, I think you just sit in a room with a load of dry, rich people while you get served sort of like eggs benedict or something. And then that's sort of like, yeah, we're in the chair circle. It's very exciting. Um, the strategy updates is probably the most sort of, you know, strategically interesting because that's when you get proper access um, to people at the top of the party to put forward your concerns and sort of say in hushed tones, sort of like if you don't, you know, do X, Y, Z, we're probably not going to find you anymore. You know, just, just saying it, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't me trying to bribe you. This is just me saying the facts. Um, and then finally, invitation to a chairs circle welcome reception at Labour Party conference hosted by Angela Rayner. Um, so one more, one more chance where you can have some, some access for cash. Anyway. Caviar with Keir or canapes with Keir? You decide. I like caviar with Keir. Caviar with Keir. And maybe I should work as the sort of headline writer for mm. some late times. You should be in charge of high value donors at the Labour Party. I think that would be. Do you imagine? Oh, that'd very, be the very successful. Um, but like you say, it just looks so, it looks so sleazy. <laughs> How can we make this look as sleazy as possible? The fucking chair circle is like, it's not even, it's like, that is, you're getting a bit conspiratorial. You know, someone said, you, oh, there's this thing called the chair circle, <laughs> um, which is a very high value True. funder for the Labour Party. And they're all very close to, to Keir Starmer, who was on the trilateral commission. Can you imagine? And now, he's joined the, now he's joined the chair circle. Can you imagine Dave Evans, the General Secretary of Labour, and Morgan McSweeney brainstorm, <laughs> and imagineering the guy. I'm thinking magic circle. <laughs> Magic circle, kind of accountancy firms. Yeah, okay, I'm seeing that. And we Power, civil society, business, chair. Yeah, we can't call it directors because we don't want people to think they actually have power, but it has to imply they have power, but also be deniable. So we won't call it the director's circle. We'll call it the chair circle. It could be a game. It could just be, even mean just be a game that you play where you all sit in this circle and chair, a bit like musical chairs, but with lots of money and lots of interests and people sort of asking if you can give them planning permission in this particular real, local authority. Real new labor ease.